Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, and it is a great honor to finally have the wonderful Sandy Cerami joining us at the roundtable. Sandy, my fellow friend from New Jersey, uh, good day and welcome to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. It's good to see you, my friend. Appreciate you having me. Hey, uh, you and I uh, came up in the business together in uh, just about a few miles from each other That's here right. in New Jersey. and. Uh, uh, I have admired your work for a long time. We have a lot of mutual friends uh, on social media together. And uh, congratulations to you, Sandy, on all the success you're having uh, with all your endeavors that I see. And uh, uh, you're, you're making some great, great strides for our retail community. Well, I appreciate it, buddy. I mean, it's, uh, it's fun. All I can tell you is that uh, I made a decision uh, about 12 years ago that whatever I did uh, from the post-GM bankruptcy forward, I was going to do to enjoy and and ultimately do whatever I can to help uh, the industry because it's something I've grown up in and, and love. So I appreciate it. And, you know, you're the real deal. You're retail. You know, a lot of folks have never worked retail and have not walked in those shoes. So I got to come and ask you, um, one of the things that I have admired about you over the years is your focus very early on the importance of dealership culture and maintaining a strong culture in that store. Sandy, long before it was a, a sexy thing to talk about, uh, you were talking about culture, building that culture. So what brought you to that so early? How did you pinpoint that? And uh, where did that you know find its place? It's a great question, Ted. I mean, you know, I, I, can, I can kind of pinpoint it to the mid 90s. Um, and yes, I was in the car business back in the mid '90s, which is a nice way of saying that I'm, I'm uh, approaching approaching the old man status uh, in the business. But you know, back in the mid '90s, I started to watch what was happening in other businesses, not necessarily the retail automotive business. And as I had uh, more and more of an opportunity to influence what was going on in our store in Paramus, you know, we were on Route 17 in Paramus, which was at the time the number two retail zip code behind Beverly Hills in the entire United States. And so there were great examples of what uh, culture could do for a business. And so early on, uh, I started to send our team out and what we would do is provide them with a $100 gift card to go and shop in a business that had made an impact uh, on me or one of our senior team members, uh, places like Restoration Hardware, um, yes. Abercrombie & Fitch, places that had real specific culture uh, with a texture to it that you could almost cut with a pair of scissors if you had to. And I, and I identified the importance of making sure that you established your own genuine and authentic culture so that people knew what to expect when they came to work in the organization and, as importantly, when they came to do business with us. I just recognized culture as something that was critically important to the success or uh, mm -hmm. a critical indication of why a business would fail. You're right. Uh, what a great laboratory located there on Route 17 in sure. uh, Paramus, because that has got to be one of the top, if not the very top, Sandy, retail shopping area in the United States. And you've got all those great names to draw from. Um, so in relation to New Jersey, um, I would be exit uh, 153 on the parkway. You'd mm -hmm. be what exit? It would be a little bit north of me. We were 165, yep. Okay, 165. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I can understand that completely. Uh, the last two years, Sandy, last two and a half years, you and I have seen a great transformation in the business. Dealers are amazingly resilient. Um, what do you think are some of the things that, you know, you know that you have learned, uh, you know, uh, in, in this seat? And what do you think are some of the takeaways, you know, for dealers in the last two, two and a half years? Wow. I mean, it's uh, it's a treasure trove of experience for sure. I mean, if you take it back to uh, the original lockdown, if you will, in March of, of 2020, uh, there was a, a lot of angst, a lot of anxiety, uh, a complete unknown uh, quantity in terms of where we were going as a I forget about it, as a business, you know, the world in general. Um, and, and I will tell you that uh, our, our buddy Scott Joseph of JNL Marketing and I had a a conversation that centered around the fact that and you and I actually crossed paths. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that in a second because it's a great example of of um, getting involved with the dealer community to solve a challenge. But but early on we were looking at it saying, God, you know, uh, we we suspended and actually retroactively took back invoicing from March 1st 
from all of our clients that were on a recurring billing yeah. um, uh, relationship with us simply because I, I couldn't in good conscience take a check when, when business had ground to a halt. So about a month in, Scott and I got together and we had a conversation about finding solutions. Um, and so we started to identify things that we could do. We picked and, and um, prodded dealers and managers in the marketplace to hear from them, you know, what they were thinking about uh, when the world would, you know, quote unquote, open up again. But I think some of the lessons that we learn is that it's never over. Uh, it's never final. And what we've got to do is be really industrious and, and intuitive in terms of finding solutions in the marketplace. And so I think we have big challenges the next two to five years that we should be focusing on. But some of the lessons from the last two are, number one, um, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, there are opportunities that you can find uh, in challenge. The minute we see um, things that we hadn't expected, I think it presents a great opportunity for us to find uh, those solutions. And so I take a look at used cars specifically, right? Used cars was an area that we all panicked on the first 45 days of the lockdown because the first thing we thought of was, holy cow, we're going to have inventory that's 45 days older. Little did we know that we would have the supply chain disruptions impacting our business and that used vehicles would actually increase in value over that period of time. So I think uh, if I summed it up in one, one simple lesson, it is that prepare for the unexpected ultimately. You, you know, you're so right. You jogged my memory. You would be there in Bergen County at ground zero because when the world changed, um, you know, you're not in Manhattan where a lot of people work, but those mm -hmm. people live in Bergen County sure. and they travel Route 4 and Route 17. So, you know, you were really at the heart uh, as as I was just a few miles away from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dealers being locked down, closed, uh, an essential business became the term. And um, yeah. you're right. Uh, Scott Joseph, very smart man. I remember coming to him and having some conversations and he's saying, OK, here's what things that dealers need to do today. We need to preserve mm -hmm. our cash. We need to and, you know, kind of drawing the whole thing out. And you're you're so right in that we got to look ahead now into the future, into the next year, two years, five years, because we got to be prepared for what's, you know, for what's coming as well. A lot of the folks who are here today have come in through the fixed ops channel service and parts. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed with the inventory, with things that are happening now with, you know, with chips and so on, used cars have become a big part of the fixed ops roundtable. In fact, sure. reconditioning and getting those you know, vehicles ready for frontline ready, you know, in a shorter amount of time has become a paramount concern. Um, what are some of the, and as I drive around, I see dealer lots remain empty and I think they're going to be, you know, probably doing this for a while. Um, what do you see in your crystal ball as we, you know, look out into the near term? Uh, at the risk of sounding like uh, a naysayer, I, I see some challenge. Uh, I see some challenge and I think it's going to be a, almost like a, a, a slow drip uh, in terms of the challenge, I see um, the the market slowing down just a bit. I don't think that we're going to see um, availability improve a great deal over the course of the next 12 months based on everything that we're hearing from the manufacturers. But on the flip side, I also see great opportunity. Uh, fixed operations becomes the focus, uh, in my opinion, for the next you know two to three years. And really, when I talk about a focus, we've got to focus on all the important things, like making sure that we've got uh, you know, top talent, top technicians, uh, people with the right mindset that understand that we're going to be doing things a bit differently, that we're going to leverage technology. I think taking a look at what the position responsibility outlines are for the people in our uh, operations, how will those change? I think the roles and responsibilities of, say, a service advisor are going to morph a bit uh, as we move forward. Finding ways that we can actively and um, positively support the role of the service service advisor, I think, is going to be a critical step in ensuring success long term over the next two to three years, because very often what we see in service drives are service advisors that either don't have a working game plan on a daily basis or are asked to do a lot more than they really are capable of doing, not because they don't have the skill set, but a lot of time it's a time issue. They don't have the tools of the time uh, in terms of resources. Uh, to accomplish everything that they need to accomplish. So making certain that that experience in the service drive uh, is supported from a positive perspective and giving service advisors all the support tools and resources that they need 
is going to go a long way. And then on the shop side of it, uh, making a commitment to tooling and technology, uh, and then making sure that you hold people accountable to making certain that they're making the best use of tools and technology so you can optimize uh, efficiency, production, and then ultimately profitability in the service and parts areas. What about on the consumer side? You know, during uh, the last two years, new things popped up like service pickup and delivery, right? Where, mm -hmm. you know, now the customer was okay with us coming to pick up their vehicle, uh, even mobile service. And you see a lot of initiatives, especially with Ford right now, you know, Ford is very much involved in these mobile service vans as Tesla is doing the service and performing the things that can be performed in mm -hmm. the customer's driveway. Do you see customers uh, continuing to want that? Um, obviously we're back in the dealership now, we're able to come to the store, but do you think that that option is gonna remain relevant uh, and perhaps even grow as we go into the future? Yeah, I think it's an awesome question, Ted. I think you're uh, right on the mark. I see mobile becoming a bigger and bigger piece of your revenue uh, pie for sure. Ed Roberts, uh, you know, Dave Bergamato, two guys that I know personally uh, have a strong commitment to mobile service. I think you're going to see the capabilities of a mobile service unit continue to grow and rapidly because you have some of these tooling and equipment companies really making uh, very uh, fast and, and uh, strong investments into making sure that they can develop the kind of tools and technology that will support the mobile service uh, end of the business. I think you're going to see the ability to, uh, I know you can actually cut rotors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from a mobile service unit right now. I've got a guy in Jersey by the name of uh, Todd Gaba, uh, who owns a, uh, a pro cut uh, distributorship, and he's actually developed a prototype that he's looking to bring to market so you can cut rotors, wow. you know, anywhere. Um, I talked to Dave Boyle recently about being able to do alignments uh, outside the shop and, and what kind of technology and tooling is gonna be available for that. So I think that it's gonna become a huge piece of the revenue pie simply because people are gonna be looking for convenience. Uh, people are gonna be looking mm -hmm. for the opportunity for you to come to them. Uh, and, and it also is an opportunity for a dealer to charge a premium for the service. One of the things that Ed Roberts did that was so brilliant early on when he was providing complimentary mobile service was he actually had a, a um, a line item on all of the invoices that showed the charge for the mobile service as mm -hmm. well as a credit to zero it out. And I think it was a brilliant way to market the fact that at some point in time to deliver this level of service, there will be a premium that you'll pay for it. But people are willing to pay a premium for convenience, uh, in my opinion, in my experience. That is that is very, very smart and it shows the value. And you mentioned our good friend, uh, David Boyle, what foresight he has had, Sandy, to see the importance of tires and yep. uh, the, the the importance of dealers focusing on them where, you know, for the past many years, we've let the aftermarket kind of, you know, eat our lunch there. But it looks like that is going to become more and more relevant if the push for EVs continues and if it is successful, as they say, um, you know, with eliminating or reducing the oil change, you know, now perhaps Dave has mentioned the tire inspection becomes the reason for that visit at the dealership. Well, Ted, you raise a great point. First of all, I think Dave Boyle's uh, team and the technology platform uh, and the tooling that they have actually uh, brought to the marketplace is the best that there is. Uh, I think that their, their go-to-market model is the mm -hmm. smartest for dealers that's out there, uh, quite honestly, uh, OPEX versus a CAPEX uh, mm -hmm. uh, model. And, um, and when we talk about tires and we talk about alignment specifically, I would challenge dealers and, and uh, general managers and fixed operations directors to take a walk down to the service department on a daily basis and just focus your attention on your alignment rack or alignment racks and tell me if there is a car on that rack or not. There should be, because the opportunity exists, a vehicle on your alignment rack or racks every second of every day. It should be a fantastic profit center. And ultimately, I think it replaces oil changes as the number one retention tool uh, for dealerships. As a matter of fact, there, there are a couple different, um, what I would consider to be innovative ideas in terms of how to do that. But I, I agree with you. I think that Dave's platform, and I think that the tire and alignment business becomes a huge profit driver and a retention driver as we move forward. Sandy, uh, last question for today. Here we are in mid-September, coming into the latter part of 22, looking into 23. Um, for the dealers, managers uh, uh, you know, who know you and those who are now are, are learning of Sandy Cerami, um, 
what advice do you have for them? You know, we talked a little bit about culture, resilience, um, and, uh, you know, the need to, uh, you know, be prepared, right? What, what advice do you have for our uh, audience watching today as you look out over the horizon into what they need to do over the next three, six, nine months or so? Uh, it's a great question. First of all, I, <laughs> uh, Gary House, uh, who is a, a legend, I call him the Oracle of Automotive, um, he and I had a, an exchange back and forth, both online and offline, about a post I put up recently regarding advice. And, and I hesitate to ever dispense advice. I don't want to give relative experience, if you will, and, and hopefully uh, some level of wisdom in terms of what I see based on the experiences that I've had. And what I would say is that the greatest investment that you can make and probably the single biggest ROI uh, on your investment that you'll see is with your people. Um, we've gone through a two year period where we've seen literally record profitability at the dealership level. That will not last forever. Um, I'm, I'm firmly uh, in the school of thought that there are some significant changes that are afoot. Um, whether or not they come to fruition or not, uh, I do not know. I think in the next five to seven years, we're gonna see uh, a lot of disruption uh, and a lot of change uh, from the OEM to the dealer relationship all the way on through till how we actually manufacture and distribute vehicles. Um, but the one thing I would say is invest in your people, because if you can create the kind of an experience for your for your employees and for your clients that people gravitate towards from a cultural perspective, but also from a skill and mindset development perspective, you're going to win in the long term, because that is the single most sustainable investment that you can make. Uh, people will tend to to want to have the opportunity to grow themselves and to create a career path uh, for the long term. Uh, and it's the single biggest way and probably the single easiest way for you to attract top talent into your dealership. Everybody, if you want to help build that top talent, Sandy Cerami is a tremendous resource. You see his contact information scrolling here at the bottom of the screen. Of course, he's on social media. He had a great conference last week uh, that was very well attended. And Sandy, congratulations to you on all the success that you're having. Uh, the podcast, uh, love the content, love the newsletter that you've got now on LinkedIn as well. And uh, Sandy, if our audience wants to reach out to you personally, what's the best way for them to, to do that? Uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'd take any and all phone calls, even if it's just to say uh, a quick hello. I'd love to connect with people out in the marketplace, pick brains, uh, and get some insight, uh, because that's where I gather most of uh, the intelligence that we have over at Sandy Ceramian Associates. But look, on any of the social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Clubhouse, uh, I would uh, invite and encourage you to, to connect there. Uh, we'll meet you wherever you are. It really makes no difference. Uh, follow our YouTube channel as well. And then the website, sandyceramian.com. Uh, has a ton of resources, a lot of them free, uh, that you can access over there. And and as I said, I take a phone call at, at any point in time, 24-7, 365, as they say. Sandy Cerami, everybody. He's retail. He's the real deal. And uh, Sandy, on behalf of the Fixed Ops Roundtable community, thank you so much for today. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Sandy Cerami here today, everybody, at the Fixed Ops Roundtable.